Hello, and welcome to Enzo's Theater of the World. I'm your host, Enzo Cunanan. And I'm Ethan. And today, we're going to be talking about the Spanish princess and the first wife of Henry VIII, Catherine of Aragon. So, I wanted to uh, just briefly preface this episode with a... Um, outline of what we're doing. So I'm going to be devoting an episode to each of the wives of Henry VIII, except for Jane Seymour and Anne of Cleves, who don't have a lot of information about them, so sadly they're going to have to combine themselves into one episode, and I'm going to discuss it in their episodes, but that's the due to no fault of their own, in my opinion. And what I want to do is kind of bring out the interesting anecdotes that I've learned from a lot of study uh, and reading about these women, these fascinating women, as well as give a sense of kind of the horrors they had to go through under Henry, and I don't mean to, like, undermine their agency as, like, royal women who were, after all, the highest in the land, but they did go through a lot, and I think we don't, I think we oftentimes like to be like, oh, ha, Henry killed his, all of his wives, ha, he didn't, he only killed two of them, but that doesn't mean that he didn't, like, well, he wasn't an asshole to them in other ways, and I think that we often don't, we, we overlook that because it's not, like, physical abuse, because there's no evidence Henry physically abused his wives, aside from the beheading. So I think that we don't uh, talk about that a lot. So let's jump right into it. So Ethan, what do you know about Catherine of Aragon? Because I've talked a lot with the tutors about you, so what do you yeah. know about her? What is your impression of her? Um, so, uh, daughter of uh, Queen Isabella and Ferdinand, the yeah. people who did the Spanish Inquisition. Really, really Catholic. Um... And then, like, let's see, obviously Spanish, first wife. Um, you know, and then got ignored in favor of the younger Anne Boleyn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she got divorced, and, you know, she famously refused to give up her her throne. But there's a lot more to her than that, and I know that people have already tried to take this approach uh, with the Spanish princess, which I hated. I hated the Spanish princess that turned Catherine, who is a complex individual in her own right and turned her into this sort of scheming, uh, sort of unsympathetic woman who kidnaps Bessie Blount's child at one point by Henry, and it's just a mess. Like, Catherine the Baby Stealer is never a trope I thought I'd have to say in any review, but, like, here we are. And uh, not to mention in that show, like, she's supposed to be the heroine, right? Mm-hmm. It's so weird to me. I watched the whole thing, and you would never get that vibe from her. She's not a... Sure, it's not Charlotte Hope's fault. I think I think it's the script writing because it's the writing the writing is awful, and every single actor is trying to do the best they can, and it's just not working. So, anyway, the real Catherine of Aragon was neither, in my opinion, the like she's sometimes portrayed as this queen of earthly queens in the words of Shakespeare, some an innocent saintly woman who did nothing wrong and who Henry and everyone else at the time just hated for no reason. And on the other hand, you have uh, well, you don't have another hand because a lot of because I think a lot of the She's got an overwhelmingly positive praise from everyone, including Shakespeare. Every single Protestant in England managed to, like... I mean, even Henry. Henry, at the time of the divorce, he wasn't like, oh, she's evil. He was like, oh, I love her. She's a good woman. It's just that we have lived in sin together. And I so, think it's just that, like, she's the first one, so you can't really fault her for anything. Yeah, but I think we should take a look at her uh, life story and just... We'll, we'll see she's more complicated than she... Uh, is often portrayed. So Catherine of Aragon was born on December 16, 1485 in Alcala de Henares, which is close to Madrid. She was the daughter, as Ethan said, of Queen Isabella of Castile and King Ferdinand of Aragon, who established the Spanish Inquisition, conquered the last Muslim kingdom in Spain with the fall of Granada in 1492, sponsored Columbus's voyages to the New World, and also kicked the Jews out of Spain. They're not great people, in my opinion, and I heard one podcast actually say that Isabella and Ferdinand were awesome. They were not awesome. Just because they worked as a husband and wife team does not make them amazing people. I don't know. It's like, like I feel like it's... I feel like calling uh, Isabella and Ferdinand awesome is something that you would get from someone who, like... Someone told them one thing about the person. I'm like, wow, they're pretty cool. Like, I don't know, like, Joe Rogan would hear yeah, they something. Didn't, they didn't... Isabella was, however, an extraordinary ruler, having restored Castilian power after the chaotic reign of her half-brother Henry IV. She was very involved in the Reconquista, which, you know, kind of deepens her guilt in the whole thing, but she, she was organizing and directing the army, although, unlike the Spanish princess, she did not, in fact, charge into battle, sword in hand, on a horse. She did not do that. Isabella 
together with her husband Ferdinand, established Spain as a global power, and kind of established it as a nation, in, uh, as a concept in general, because they were, you know, ruling, they, they kind of joined the forces to make the concept of Spain. So Catherine was the youngest of five siblings, and we're not going to get into too much detail about them. The eldest was Isabella, who, who married the king married the king of Portugal, and then she died. The second eldest was Juan, Ferdinand and Isabella's only son, who married who married the Archduchess Margaret of Austria, but died at the age of 19 with no children. And the third eldest was Juana, who, who to sum it up briefly, married Philip the Handsome of Burgundy, had six children by him, including Charles, the future Holy Roman Emperor. Then later, after his death, got gaslit and imprisoned by her father to to such an extent that she is, in my opinion, the 1500s equivalent of Britney Spears in the present day. The fourth eldest was Marie... Was Charles, um... Was he, like, a Habsburg? Or yes, he, he, Philip yeah. uh, Philip the Handsome was a Habsburg, and that's where the Habsburgs yeah. become Spanish. They had the big chins by yes. now, right? You yes, know. Charles had a very big chin, which he hid with a beard. So the fourth eldest then was Maria, three years older than Catherine, and she also married the king of Portugal, her her former brother-in-law. So Catherine of Aragon was the youngest child. She was very well educated because her mother didn't, Isabella didn't grow up with a good Latin education because she wasn't expected to be heir. So she provided all children with great educations in Latin, literature, history, theology, and also domestic arts like sewing, drawing, and cooking. Like her mother, Catherine was a devout Catholic, although to be fair, Protestantism wasn't a thing yet, so like... She kind of had to be a devout she Catholic. She was, like, born in Spain. What else is she going to be? Yeah, Catherine... And Catherine had a fair complexion with pale skin, blue eyes, and light auburn hair. She was considered very pretty when she was young, with Sir Thomas More remarking when she came to England that she possesses all those qualities that make for beauty in a very charming young girl. And I, I, I feel like I have to mention here, you know, that description of, you know, blue eyes, auburn hair... So many depictions of her are literally just, uh, she's an old Spanish woman, they, like, black hair, yeah. kind of, like, tan skin. Like, no, she was, like, pale and she blue was a very She was very white. She was, she was, like, you know... They it, hear Spanish and immediately go to, like, the, the most stereotypical idea of, like, a middle-aged Spanish Christian. Yeah, and I have, like, no problem. Like, some of the best portrayal of Catherine, in my opinion, was Maria Doyle Kennedy and the Tudors, and she had black hair, but she also had blue eyes, but, like, and pale skin. So, like, it, it doesn't matter. It, it The physical appearance in portrayals, and I'll talk about this at the end, is less important to me than how you portray the person. So growing up, Catherine lived among other places in the Alhambra, which it was taken from the Emirate of Granada in 1492 by her parents. And the Alhambra, if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it has these lovely pools and sh and like they had bathrooms with hot and cold running water and there were oranges and almonds and figs and pomegranates, which were later be a symbol, with like gold and ivory ceilings and calligraphy on the walls. It's just Islamic architecture. It rocks. It's very pretty. And also it was it's sunny. The one thing that they liked about Muslims, the architecture. Yeah, they kind of appropriated that. It was sunny and warm. But the thing is, in, they had already sealed the alliance, an alliance with Portugal, uh, Spain had. And Spain's rival at this time was France. And guess who else was a rival of France? Well, also... England. And they had already secured the Netherlands with their marriage of Juana, and they had secured Portugal with uh, the, with, with the marriage of Maria, Catherine's, Catherine's sister. So they needed to make an alliance with England just so to keep France off their back a bit. And so they, in 1489, the Treaty of Medina del Campo was signed, which agreed that Catherine would be married to King Henry VII of England's heir, Arthur, Prince of Wales. Catherine was three, Arthur was two. The sealed in Anglo-Spanish alliance, and it's worth noting how much of a diplomatic coup this was for Henry the Seventh, considering he had only been king for four years, and he had actually taken the throne from the previous king, Richard the Third, who himself had basically imprisoned and probably murdered his nephew Edward Edward the Fifth in order to become king. So it was it, this was the end of the Wars of the Roses, which was a civil war between nobles in England, and so Henry the Seventh didn't have a very strong claim to the throne. And so it was very, he, he was very lucky with this. And so in 1497, Catherine and Arthur were betrothed by proxy, and two years later they were married by proxy, which is a thing you did back then because you couldn't travel, because like you wanted to secure the marriage between the countries, but you know, travel it is dangerous. Yeah, and it takes time and you need to wait for them to grow up. So you do want to like sort of secure 
the process and kind of make it binding in church law before they even meet, just for reasons of state. And interestingly enough, there's some letters that survive from Elizabeth of York, the Queen of England at that point, and the wife of Henry VII and mother of Prince Arthur to Isabella and Catherine. And they talk about how she should be drinking, get used to drinking beer and like wine because like the water in England is not good. And also how she should be learning French just so as a means of communicating with Arthur. And I can't figure out, and every other podcast I've listened to has also expressed confusion on this, and I can't figure it out either. Why on earth didn't they just cut out the middleman and, like, teach Catherine English? Well, get... I get, because, you know, it's not a romantic language. And also, it's not like, I guess it's not like a big country at the time, but, like, it is still the country she's going to. Like, yeah, but I feel like learning French from Spanish is easier than... She was learning... Well, I mean, she was also... Learn Latin is easier. I guess it's I guess. just they're like, well, it's the lingua franca, so... Yeah, that's true, that's true. And Arthur would have definitely known French. If a lot of these nobles would have known French. I think for diplomacy, if you have to learn one language at that time, you should learn French. Anyway, in 1501, at the age of 15, Catherine journeyed from Belhambra across Spain to the port of Loreto. She would never see Spain again, or imagine, her parents. Imagine leaving, like, the Spanish climate, great sky, to, uh, England... It's so rainy there. I can't imagine how, like, God, that, she must have been depressed initially, like. Imagine, like, leaving Spain for the first time, right? Yeah, she had, like. And then you find out that's what England looks like. She did uh, have a smaller entourage than her sisters. Uh, She had, like, I think, like, 50 or 60 servants with her, including at least two slaves. And I think people don't acknowledge this a lot. The Spanish princess showed black people in her retinue, but they didn't acknowledge they were slaves. Uh, they were slaves. It is recorded as them being slaves. Up until England, right? And then yeah. they became servants. Yeah, because England didn't have a, didn't recognize slavery as a thing in their law. They were like, no, everyone is free in England. And so, Catherine sort of, I guess, had to free them when she got to England. But, like, I feel people don't and this is what makes her more morally ambiguous than I think she has often been thought of as, because uh, she owns slaves. I really don't care, frankly, if she was 15, and so she probably didn't have a lot of say in whether or not she did it. And also, like, you know, it was the, it was the dominant intellectual climate at the time in Spain was very much sl- slavery is justified because Aristotle and the Bible justify it. Like, I, I, I don't care. She, she still did own slaves, and I think people, and I think every person she is a, she was a human being like everyone else and their tendency has been to see her as a near saint and honestly she's not she she Catherine could be stubborn she could she could be very self-righteous and she also owns slaves that's the I think you know for any like monarch it, it's kind of impossible to be a saintly figure yeah Catherine was like, you have to do so much that like, you're going to make decisions that are, like, morally incorrect at times. Catherine genuinely tried, I think, but, yeah, she is a, she is an ambiguous figure at times. The journey, to Eng- the journey to England was rough, and although Catherine was supposed to arrive at Southampton, her ship docked at Plymouth instead. The inhabitants greeted her joyously, with one observer remarking, she couldn't have been received with greater rejoicings if she had been savior of the world. She then began the slow journey towards London. However, she met King Henry and Prince Arthur on the road, who they took her surpri- uh, sur- uh, they took her by surprise while she was lodged at Dodgemer's Field w- w- uh, at the Bishop's uh, Manor there. On the road, however, they were informed they couldn't see Catherine because Spanish custom dictated that Catherine would remain veiled until the wedding. Henry continued ahead, and when members of Catherine's entourage tried to dissuade her, he threatened to meet her in her bedchamber if need be. Catherine, however, the diplomatic woman that she was, bowed to English custom and received him in one of her outer chambers. Her veil was lifted and she curtsied to King Henry. Now, what? Now Henry really liked how Catherine looked, but what type of man did Catherine see when the veil was lifted? Henry VII was tall, with mousy brown hair, bad teeth, according to his biographer Polydor Virgil, small blue eyes, and a somewhat greedy-looking mouth, according to the portraits. Prince Arthur was then formally introduced to Catherine, and future husband and wife met for the first time. Despite his name, Arthur was no King Arthur, at least not physically. He was pale and delicate, with the same red hair as his younger brother Henry, and Spanish observers later remarked on his frail appearance. However, most people saw nothing wrong with him. Catherine married Arthur in person, this time November 14, 1501, in St. Paul's Cathedral. All of London decked itself out in costly jewels and tapestries to welcome the Spanish princess, and her brother and Arthur's younger brother, Prince Henry, had actually led her through the city a few days earlier. As 
Prince Henry led her on her wedding day from the palace down the cathedral aisle, her face covered by a filmy white silk veil, beautifully embroidered in gold. Catherine would have Catherine would have noticed the stage erected along the church so that everyone could see the royal couple, so that's where the ceremony would take place. She had no idea, of course, that Prince Henry would later be her future husband. After the wedding, Catherine accompanied Arthur to Ludlow Castle on the Welsh border. However, on April 2, 1502, Arthur died of an unknown illness, possibly the mysterious sweating sickness which ravaged England at this time, where you would sweat a lot and then die. Do we, have we figured out what that probably was? It was some sort of mm-hmm. flu, I think, they put it point, pinpoint. I don't think they yeah. could figure out what it was. Maybe it was like a mutation that just happened there. Catherine was now a 16-year-old widow after just five months of marriage. Her future was now almost entirely dependent on the geopolitical machinations of her parents and King Henry. Catherine didn't attend Arthur's funeral at Worcester Cathedral, but now that she was a widow, Ferdinand and Isabella wanted to preserve the Anglo-Spanish alliance by marrying Catherine to Prince Henry, since if she wasn't a virgin, her proposed marriage to her brother-in-law would violate Leviticus and thus be forbidden by canon law. Catherine and her governess, Doña Elvira, however, troubled the Spanish by insisting the marriage wasn't consummated, because if it had been, she could have demanded a lot of money from her lands as Dowager Princess of Wales. Eventually, everyone agreed that Catherine hadn't consummated the marriage with Arthur, who, after all, was 15. Only 15. And, and, and everyone... And Catherine and Henry were betrothed later, th- later that year on June 25, 1503. This, which slightly lightened the mood at court, as Queen Elizabeth of York had died in childbirth just a few months before. And the next year, Catherine's mother Isabella died, which meant that she was now only the daughter of the King of Aragon, a less powerful kingdom than Gisquil. Catherine, at this point, was suffering mentally from all this uncertainty, and she had deprived, developed a type of anorexia from excessive fasting, seemingly because she couldn't control anything in her life, and so she, I guess she had to control this. Alarmed, the Pope... The King Henry had Prince Henry write to Pope Julius II, ordering Catherine to eat, which the Pope agreed, and gave Prince Henry power to prevent her from fasting, saying that she may not, without your permission, observe these devotions and prayers and fasting and abstinence and pilgrimage or any other project of hers that would stand in the way of the procreation I just of children. Find it funny that like they had to write to the Pope for that. Yeah, the Pope then said something that that the Pope nowadays would probably say too, which is that a wife does not have the full power of her body. And if the devotions and fasting of the wife, if they are thought to be stand in the way of her physical health and the procreation of children, can be revoked and annulled by men. So yeah, very patriarchal. Uh, with the death of Queen Isabella, there was a power struggle that erupted in Castile between Catherine's father, Ferdinand, and Queen Juana's husband, Philip the Handsome, who was not handsome, despite, according to his portrait. Juana was not included because she was mentally unstable and also because she was a woman. Uh, a lot of more geopolitics ensued. Uh, which resulted in King Henry deciding to hedge his bets and have the four, now 14-year-old Prince Henry secretly net renounce the marriage treaty with Catherine. Juan and Philip did end up meeting King, he- King Henry in 1506, but after that, Philip died and Juan went fully crazy, at least according to her father. N- negotiations for the marriage dragged on and on, and in 1507, Catherine was appointed ambassador of Aragon to England, one of, the first woman ambassador in European history, at least, I think. Please, if anyone knows, please contact us. Uh, contact me at enzoacunanan at gmail.com with any co- comments on anything I got wrong I say in this episode. Even with this arrangement, however, Catherine was unable to persuade King Henry to improve her living conditions, and she resorted to selling some of the plates she brought over from Spain, and it was reported her, she and her ladies even had to buy eat stale fish in order to save money, which I'm not sure that's true. Yeah, Maybe they I, were exaggerating. Like, they were... They, they might not have been financially that well off, but I think you can do better than buying stale fish. Catherine it's did not have, that bad. Catherine wrote pleading letters to her father, begging him to send her more money, but he, you know, refused. Catherine did have Catherine's letters during this time do have somewhat of a self pitying streak to them, and like it's very much like a oh I'm so poor, and like I get it, you're poor by aristocratic standards, but like what would the peasant have to say about this? I don't yeah, think they like, care. Her biggest issue is like finding a way to pay for the marriages yeah. of like all of her servants ladies yeah. in waiting and whatnot but like you don't have to eat stale fish you're still like royalty catherine was still the betrothed of henry prince of wales and so technically the princess of wales but at this point she was at her lowest state by 1509 the new spanish ambassador don gutierrez gomez de fuenzalida which is a lovely name became convinced the marriage would never happen and he arranged for catherine's household to return to spain and even catherine had broken down and she said 
wrote to her father saying, As things here become daily worse and my life more and more insufferable, I can no longer bear this in any manner. Do not let me perish in this way. But Catherine's world was soon up, turned upside down because on April 21, 1509, King Henry VII died from tuberculosis and Prince Henry became King Henry VIII. Within 24 hours of his succession, Henry decided to marry Catherine, which was almost certainly a love match. Catherine was pretty, intelligent, and a genuine sweetheart who Henry had grown to love. And as he wrote to her father Ferdinand later that year, even if we were still free, it is she, nevertheless, that we would choose for our wife above all others. Henry and Catherine were married in a quiet ceremony on June 11, 1509. She took as her motto, humble and lo and loyal, and just 13 days later, Henry and Catherine were crowned queen, king and queen of England. The courtier Lord Munji, which is how you say it, it I know, it, it's, it's it sounds like... Mount Joy. Yeah, but it's but... Munji, I believe. Spoke for everyone when he enthused, The heavens laugh, the earth exults, all things are full of milk, of honey, and of nectar. Our king does not desire gold or gems or precious metals, but virtue, glory, and immortality. Henry at this point... That poorly aged. At this point, Henry was, well, yeah, but Henry at this time was energetic, handsome, red-haired, six foot two, loved to wrestle, joust, play tennis, hunt. He was an intellectual, well-read and educated in classical literature, history, theology, philosophy, rhetoric. He spoke Latin and French. He also learned Greek. He loved playing instruments like the lute and organ and po composing his own music and poems. To the great joy of Henry and the, so he was a real, uh, he was a real Renaissance man. At least he portrayed himself as. And like, he, as much of a Renaissance man as money could buy. Yeah. Like, you, you didn't really have the talent part of it, but... To the great joy of Henry and the court, Catherine became pregnant just a few months after the coronation. As Catherine's pregnancy advanced, however, she was confronted with the first of many instances of her husband's adultery. Henry had been carrying on an affair with Anne Hastings, sister to the powerful Duke of Buckingham, and Catherine, according to reports, was, quote, quote vexed with the king. Well, understandably, I guess. Things soured further in January the next year when Catherine miscarried. However, her belly was still swollen and she wasn't menstruating, so they thought that she was actually carrying twins, and so only one of them was dead. Henry eagerly began to prepare for the birth of an heir, and Catherine took to her chamber to give birth. However, Catherine's periods then returned, and her swollen belly began to subside. Catherine seems to have thought that there was a false... Have, seems to have tricked her body into thinking there was going to be a pregnancy, and a case of phantom pregnancy or pseudocyesis. Catherine, however, would soon become pregnant again, and on New Year's Day 1511, Catherine gave birth to a boy. The court and all of England rejoiced because the succession was secured. His name was Henry, and at his birth, he had automatically become the Prince of the Duke of Cornwall. Prince Henry's birth was celebrated by jousts and feasts, but sadly, he died only 52 days after his birth. Catherine and Henry were devastated, but hopes remained high. I think I find it funny how, like, how Henry had, like, six, um wives and like was trying his whole life for male heirs and like even after all that his one male heir died at like 15 anyway in all fairness he did seem like a strong kid for up until that point until till the tb took yeah in. henry was like his medieval predecessors really into chivalry and he wanted to gain glory on the battlefield and six decades after england had lost nearly all of its territory on Europe, the, the continent in the Hundred Years' War. France was the natural target, and so in June 1513, Henry sailed for France, leaving the once again Cath pregnant Catherine as regent in his absence. Trouble was brewing in the north, however, and King James IV of Scotland was preparing to invade England. Catherine started organizing the English defense, sending in artillery, supplies, and armor to the front line. She would not chart she did not plan to charge into battle herself, however, because this would have been unthinkable, and also she was, like, pregnant. According yeah, to a Spanish... Would, would have been a really bad idea. Of course to Get, like, 15 arrows shot into your belly the moment you charge in. Yeah, unlike the Spanish princess, where she charges in and... Without someone. a weapon. Yeah, she kills one dude, and that's... Scene. Yeah, I hated that. According to a Spanish contemporary, Catherine gave a rousing speech to the English army, saying that the quote-unquote Lord smiled upon those who stood in defense of their own and praising the courage of the English people. Catherine was a hundred, a few, a hundred or so miles away when King James and the Earl of Surrey, her commander, met at Flodden Field on September 9, 1513. The Scots were annihilated. King James, an archbishop, a bishop, twelve earls, fourteen lords, and more than ten thousand soldier, Scottish soldiers lay dead on the field. Catherine, in one of her less one of her less dignified moments, sent King James's bloody armor to Henry as a trophy, adding that she would have liked to send his corpse as well, but, quote-unquote, our Englishmen's hearts would not suffer You know, it. for how much of a Catholic she was, I don't think that was very Christ-like of her. And as Jesus said, send the bodies of your enemies to your husband to gloat over. Turn the other cheek, unless they really deserved it, and it's kind of awesome. 
Meanwhile, Henry only won a few minor battles in France before withdrawing. It was really Catherine, not Henry in my opinion, who won the important victory of 1513. But Catherine, being herself, humbly downplayed Flodden and celebrated Henry's French battles as if he had saved England. He didn't. Catherine did give birth to a boy around September of that year, however, he seems to have died at birth. Catherine's bad luck continued, and in November 1514, she gave birth to another son, who died, you know, as soon as he got out of the womb. Even worse, Henry had fallen out with her father, Ferdinand. Ferdinand had promised to invade France with Henry and the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian, but he had actually concluded a separate peace with France in March that year, leaving Henry on the defensive, and in his fury, he v v Henry vented his anger on Catherine. And in December 15, in December 1514, Henry staged a surprise Christmas mask, as his, was his wont to do. He and seven other masked lords and ladies burst into Catherine's chambers and danced with the queen and her maids. Among the ladies present was Elizabeth Blunt, a charming lady in waiting to Catherine. By May 1515, Catherine had become pregnant again, and... Already there were rumors flying that Henry wanted to set her aside for a French princess, which seemed to be unfounded, but the fact they were being spoken says a lot. Henry must have been easy at his lack of a son, but surely she would give birth to one soon, right? On February 18, 1516, at Greenwich Palace, Catherine gave birth. The child was healthy, but it was a girl. Still, Henry and Catherine were delighted, and at last they had a healthy child. Although the celebrations were muted compared to that of a son... Henry told the Venetian ambassador, We are both young. If it was a daughter this time, by the grace of God, sons will follow. Oops. Catherine's daughter was baptized three days after the birth, and she was named Mary. By 1517, however, Catherine was pregnant again. The next year, Catherine gave birth to a girl, quote unquote, to the vexation of everyone. And really? the girl. And because the girl died soon after birth. I mean, so, knowing the track record, I really wouldn't have been all that vexed. I, I think they were vexed because they knew the girl was going to die soon. She <laughs> couldn't have been that That's strong tough. looking. If Catherine didn't know yet, she must have at least suspected that she wouldn't be pregnant much longer. And indeed, this was to be her last pregnancy. How old was she by now? Catherine, at this point, was 32. That's, you're all You're really cutting it close now. It is difficult to imagine, therefore, how devastated Catherine must have felt when Elizabeth Blunt, yes, Hen gave birth in 1519, yes, her lady in waiting, gave birth in 1519 to a healthy baby boy. This wasn't any son, however. This one's father was Henry. Hence I think everyone knew that knew that she was going to be the another one of Henry's affairs the moment you said charming lady in waiting. Henry. Henry was was so overjoyed with the fact that he finally had a son that he named his the boy Henry Fitzroy, which means son of the king. It was one thing to ignore her husband's affairs with her ladies, but in the knowledge of that Elizabeth Blunt had succeeded where she couldn't, namely giving Henry a, ma a, a son, it must have devastated Catherine. Six years later, Henry recognized Henry Fitzroy as a son before the entire court and named Lord Adam. That's... That's such a blow to your wife. Lord Admiral, Earl of Nottingham, and Duke of Richmond in Somerset. Catherine, in one of her few times where she expressed outrage over his affairs, uh, blew up and and was afraid he was setting Fitz Henry Fitzroy up as a rival to marry. Catherine in, was furious with Henry and, in and made it known, and in retribution, he dismissed three of her Spanish ladies from court. Imagine, like, uh, trying so hard for, like, a healthy baby boy, and then your husband's, like, mistress does it on the first try and then he names him like i don't know like henry's son and then shows him off to the entire court that's such a blow blow catherine be like weep catherine bears it patiently that is to say she suffers that is a line a good line from wolf hall by hillary mantel by 1519, Catherine had gained a lot of weight, at least due to the portraits that we have due to her six pregnancies, and her beauty had, by, con by contemporary standards at the time, faded. She was now 33, and her once golden auburn hair seems to have faded, according to a muddy brown. A contemporary observer remarked that she was, quote-unquote, rather ugly than otherwise, although a Venetian writing during the height of the divorce later would know that she, quote-unquote, always has a smile on her face. Catherine, for all of her popularity, dignity, and success in fulfilling the traditional queenly roles of intercession, piety, and pop, and, and 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 dignity, as well as setting as well as a happy family life, had failed in her primary role of giving birth to a baby boy. Catherine took solace in religion, spending hours praying in her chapel and wearing a hair shirt, which is like a rough, coarse fabric beneath her gowns to uh, to like scratch the skin and like make it. It's uh, like a penance thing. Yeah. To the joy of the public, she fulfilled her traditional queenly charitable duties with aplomb, giving £1,300 per year, which is nearly a million dollars in today's money. Although, to be fair, 
Anne Boleyn did give more, according and to some also, sources. And also, like, not just under a million dollars is like, if you're the queen, come on. But then again, this was like, you know, back then. Yeah. So Catherine, you can't expect the poor and to also, get that And much. also, I should note as a caveat, Cap- Anne did give more, but it's probably because she wanted to... She wasn't pop- as popular with the people as Catherine, so she did have to give more to sort of crudely, I guess, buy their loyalty. I don't want to say label it like that because she and, and does genuinely seem to have wanted to be liked by the people. It's just that, and, and she knew that the way to their hearts was sort of like easing their pain with donations and stuff. But the problem is, you know, lots of the sorts. We'll talk about that later in the Anne episode. But she's not as popular as Catherine. Uh, when she successfully interceded in 1517 for 400 criminals condemned to death for the role in the evil May Day riots, her popularity soared even higher. Catherine also threw herself into overseeing Princess Mary's education, making sure she was thoroughly grounded in the classics, music, dancing, and foreign languages. Catherine even commissioned a book on the importance of female education by Juan Luis Vives, a Spanish humanist. Although, in all fairness, un- although in all fairness, Juan Luis Vives did advocate against women reading fiction because he thought that it would be a distraction from important stuff like praying and said that their weak brains couldn't handle it. And he also said... Uh, they can't handle fiction? Because they might think it's real. I, I'm so baffled by the... Like, I, I would think, like, you can't teach them history because they might try to take too much inspiration. But like, Oh, no, you need fiction. to be inspired by history so that you can be a good woman, according to him. What's wrong with fiction? I legitimately don't understand this claim. Catherine of Aragon does not seem to have followed this no-fiction rule for Mary, for what it's worth, so good on her for knowing uh, that that's absolute BS. Uh, and we shouldn't try to make Catherine into a girl-boss feminist, because she wasn't. She was very much a woman of her time. She's she, still, like, a traditional Catholic She believed that men were. She seems to believe that men were the superior sex, and... The church, Everyone the did. church, the Bible, the literature and philosophers of ancient Greece and Rome all advocated for patriarchy. But at least Catherine educate, believed in educating women, so that's nice. Princess Mary was betrothed twice, first to the crown prince of France and then to her first cousin, Emperor Charles V. But both betrothals, thankfully, came from nothing. I see thankfully only, in the, ca- like, relate, only you know. in the case of Charles V because they're related and that's gross. In was Charles V uh, another Habsburg? Yes, he was. He was. Uh, that would have been. Rough. He was sixteen years older than Mary, so he decided he couldn't wait for her to grow up and marry a Portuguese princess. Uh, in 1520, Catherine attended the magnificent field of cloth of gold between Guin and Ardre in France, with Henry to secure an alliance with Francis I. The summit was magnificent. The tents and clothes with glittered with cloth of gold. There was a temporary palace made of cloth and timber that looked like stone and brick. Wine fountains. And Henry had jousts and banquets and wrestling matches, the, the latter of which he infamously lost to to Francis the First in. Ultimately, however, the I don't really understand what was the point of that. It match. was to try. Oh, yeah, Henry's ego. I was. Go- I thought you were going to yeah, say like, what was the point of the field of cloth of gold, and I was like to make an alliance. With like France. the re- the rest. Like that's the thing, though. If you're trying to make an alliance, why would you try to challenge the ruler? To a zero-sum game where either you piss them off or you're embarrassed in front of your entire people. I have no idea, and for what it's worth, the English sources do not say anything about this failure on the part of their king. We have to get it from the French sources. The field of the cloth of gold, however, was an expensive failure, as relations with France ultimately soon deteriorated, and Catherine must must have beamed as England became allies of her nephew, the emperor, and... Uh, that uh, a few by, by by a few years later, in 1524, Catherine started menopause, and it was clear by this point that there were no children coming. Henry stopped sleeping with her, leaving Princess Mary as the heir to the throne. Catherine was confident that Mary could rule, but others weren't sure, including Henry. After all, the last time a queen had ruled in England was dur- was with Empress Matilda during a period known as the Anarchy, where her cousin Stephen tried to take the throne from her. How how long ago was this? 1100s. Yeah, okay. There, no one would. It was known as the age when Christ and his angel slept, which, you know, not a good sign. That's a little rule, rude for a woman leader, but. the No, it was because of the anarchy part of it. It was worse than the Wars of the Roses. Female rulers were also more vulnerable to rivals for the throne who could argue that their sex made them superior to a female ruler. In contrast, a son would have secured the Tudor dynasty and been much more difficult to resist. In an effort to educate Mary in governing, since he couldn't quite figure out a solution yet, Henry sent her to Ludlow Castle, where Arthur had died in 23 years before, in 1525. Three years earlier, 
A, the younger daughter of the English ambassador to France had arrived at court. Around 21, with a tan complexion and striking dark eyes and hair, she managed to captivate male courtiers despite her rather plain appearance by 1500 standards. She had become a lady-in-waiting to Catherine's former sister-in-law, Margaret of Austria, when she was only 12, and served as a lady-in-waiting to Queen Claude of France from the ages of 14 to 20. She was witty, feisty, and sophisticated. After her debut that year at a, in a pageant called the Chateau Vert, playing Perseverance, Anne Boleyn became one of Catherine of Aragon's ladies-in-waiting. After a bunch of drama involving a, a guy named Henry Percy and, another po and a poet named Thomas Wyatt, which we will discuss in her own episode, in 1526, Henry started pursuing Anne, writing love letters to her and asking her to give herself up, quote-unquote, heart, body, and soul. You know, like, later on in Henry's, um... Life. I wonder if people were just, like, predicting who his next wife would be, like, here are the up-and-comers for this year who might be... I do know that there was one woman after Catherine Howard's fall who was arrested for saying something like, how many wives will the king have? And she was arrested because Henry didn't like her, making fun of his marriages up. Henry continued, to, unlike other ladies, however, Anne refused to be Henry's mistress, likely out of a genuine desire to not sully her value in the marriage market, and yes, I will expand on that in her own episode. Henry continued to pursue her, however, and over time, I think, Anne fell in love with Henry. Henry was now set on annulling his marriage to Catherine, firstly, because he didn't have a son, and that was a serious problem, and secondly, because he w had fallen in love with Anne Boleyn. In fact, it's likely Henry had convinced himself by this point she had lied or been mistaken somehow about not consummating the marriage with Prince Arthur. And he was also confident that he could get an annulment from the Pope and the Church. After all, King Louis XII of France had managed to do that just a few decades earlier, so there was an Pope, prince, kings got annulments all the time, so there's no reason to think that there would be any particular, you know, struggle with this, even if Catherine did refuse. Henry informed Catherine they needed to separate because of his grave doubts, quote-unquote, about the morality of their marriage on June 22, 1527. Although Catherine had already heard rumblings about an annulment, her hearing Henry tell her to her face caused her to burst into tears, and despite her, his efforts to comfort her, she couldn't, she refused to be comforted, and Henry begged her to keep his desire for an annulment secret for now. People across Europe, however, already knew about what would be known as the King's Great Matter. Later that summer, Henry proposed to Anne, and she accepted. Despite Henry's wish for Catherine to just retire to a nunnery so he could marry Anne, Catherine refused because she had been raised since the age of two that she would to be Queen of England. She also solemnly swore that she had never consummated her marriage to Prince Arthur. Also, that's so rude. A nunnery? She was the queen, and you can't think of any other. That's place. what King Louis the Twelfth did to his former to so his wife so John of Valois. Can you just tell her to like disappear into a castle or something? Why a nunnery? Uh, because then, that, because then that, because even if because like you don't have to agree to the annulment, you you take the vows, which sort of dissolves the marriage between you yeah. and Henry. So were they? Did they? The people who there because, were they like actual nuns, or were they just kind of like nun in name? I have no idea. I I don't know because they never got to the place where they would name a nunnery because Catherine refused at all points. To no, but I mean like this. for the other woman who got sent to a uh, nunnery. John of Valois, who was Louis the Twelfth's first wife, did get sent to a nunnery, and she, she seems to have become a literal nun because she became a saint later on because uh. she like founded a religious order and stuff. Uh. I'm actually inclined to believe Catherine didn't consummate the marriage with Prince Arthur also because, you know... Kind and, of ugly. No, Catherine... Pe okay, people are like, oh, they, they're teenagers, they would have done it, and they needed to consummate the marriage on the first day. No, they didn't. You know why? Because Catherine's brother, Juan, who I mentioned earlier, died at the age of 19, probably from some respiratory illness, but back then they thought it was... They rumored it was because he had been sleeping too much with his wife. So they thought, actually, that sleeping... that That... Overindulgence in sex when you were a teenager was a bad thing, and they did caution you to restrain yourself. So I wouldn't have been surprised if they did want to, like, if both uh, ha ha Catherine and Arthur's parents told them to not sleep together just yet and to wait a year or so. And also, like, wasn't the sweating sickness kind of around at this time? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was. It killed him four or five months into the marriage. I forgot which, but like, right. so yeah. It's possible also he may have had testicular cancer, which may have killed him, so we don't know. Anyway, so 
The annulment proceedings, however, were complicated by the fact that Pope, the Pope, Clement VII, was being currently held hostage by Catherine's nephew. The like, whole... like actual hostage, like he kidnapped him? Well, no, it was part of a thing known as the Sack of Rome, where people, where priests and nuns were murdered and raped in the streets, and Rome was sacked, and the Pope was basically held under guard. It wasn't a ca- kidnapping, it was more of a... I just find it funny to, like, kidnap him, to sail him all the way over back to your place, and then you know, cut and paste from documents, like, you know, like a, (laughs) oh my god, like a, like a, like a, um, like a ransom note, yeah, you need to get him back, the cat, I can't find an R, do you have a, yeah, help, as a result, the Pope was very indecisive and tried to please both Henry and Catherine by hemming and hawing and doing everything in his power to not make a decision, which, of course, did not work. The common people rallied in support of Catherine, cheering whenever she appeared in public. Anne was vilified as a seductor, stealing Henry away from their saintly queen. And the fact Anne was A, a evangelical, B, supported royal supremacy over the church, C, a break with Rome, did not help with her reputation. In the years to come, people will be arrested for and prosecuted for calling Anne, among other things, a common stewed whore, a harlot for her living, and a goggle-eyed whore. That's a little mean. In late 1531, there was even a report that an angry mob of 8,000 people tried to kill Anne while she was dining in a river villa on the Thames, and she only narrowly escaped by taking a boat at the last minute, which may be false. I, I think it's an interesting story, though. Uh... In 1528, the Pope sent a representative, Cardinal Campeggio, to try the validity of Catherine's marriage to Henry in England. Catherine wanted it tried at Rome because she feared that an English trial would skew the proceedings in favor of Henry. The next year, in June 21, 1529, Catherine knelt before Henry and gave an impassioned speech defending her marriage in front of the Legatine court. Some of, here is some of it. Sir, I beseech you for all the love that have, has been between us, and for the love of God, let me have justice and right. Take of me some pity and compassion. For I am a poor woman and a stranger born out of your dominion. I have here no assured friend and much less indifferent counsel. I flee to you as head of justice in this realm. Alas, sir, wherein have I offended you? Or what occasion of displeasure have I designed against your will and pleasure, intending, as I perceive, to put me from you? I take God and all the world to witness that I have been to you a true, humble, and obedient wife, ever conformable to your will and pleasure. These twenty years I have been your true wife, and by me you have had diverse children, although it hath pleased God to call them out of this world, which has been no default in me. And when you had me at the first, I take God to be my judge. I was a true maid without touch of man, and whether it be true or not, I put it to your conscience. If there be any just cause by the law that you can allege against me, either of dishonesty or any other impediment to banish and put me from you, I am well content to depart to my great shame and dishonor. And if there be none, then here I most lowly beseech you, let me remain in my former state and receive justice at your hands. I most humbly require you, in the name of charity and for the love of God, who is the just judge, to spare me the extremity of this new court, until I may be advised what way and order my friends in Spain will advise me to take. And if ye will not extend to me such a different favor, your pleasure then be fulfilled, and to God I commit my cause. She was kneeling during this, actually, and she, as I said, and Henry tried to raise her up a number of times, but she refused, remaining on her feet. She, she bowed before Henry, and then walked out of the courtroom as the crier, as the crier dude shouted, Catherine, Queen of England, come again to court. But she refused, saying, this court, saying basically to her usher Griffith, this court is biased against me, I won't come, go back. Uh, she was very much playing to the crowd here, and I don't say that in a bad way. She was, she knew how to make a good speech, and she knew how to present herself as she, as she thought of herself to persuade the people that she was this uh, this wronged innocent wife and like i do like i'm not saying that she's like scheming and stuff i just think that she genuinely had a a bigger eye for pr than like this wasn't an impromptu thing she didn't plan this and that's there's nothing wrong with that i think there is something wrong with you if you try to say oh it's bad that she engaged in politics in this way and tried to appeal to people like she is a queen yeah like what is like I think it's even more insulting of people, frankly, to be like, oh, that's not a good attitude to take towards her. Like, no, I think that giving her that agency and recognizing that she had agency is an important thing. Uh, also, like, Henry's doing politics, too, so it's not yeah. fair to her. She has to play by what's, like, holy rules. Yeah. By now, of course, Henry avoided her in private. In public, they had to appear together in order to give the annulment proceedings legitimacy to make it seem like Henry wasn't just being horny for Anne Boleyn. Anne used her newfound influence to promote reformist ideas, giving Henry a copy of William Tyndale's Obedience of a Christian Man, advocating for royal supremacy in both the state and the church. 
Catherine must have been troubled by this because she was a big Catholic, and just a month after her her speech, Cardinal Campeggio revoked the annulment proceedings to Rome, dealing a death blow to the fortunes of Henry's chief advisor, Cardinal Wolsey, who had promised a quick annulment. He was also Car Catherine's enemy, for not only for what she saw as his impious behavior, but also his attempts to arrange a French alliance. Anne managed to, con along with her faction, managed to convince Henry that Wolsey wasn't committed to securing the annulment. He was stripped of his titles, and a year later, in 1530, he died while en route to London for his treason trial. Henry had grown tired by this time of the Pope dithering over the annulment, and, and since he had always been a firm believer in the divine right of kings, he began to turn to Protestant ideas, turning to a man named Thomas Cromwell to help persuade Parliament pass legislation which would lead to the break with Rome. In 1531, Henry managed to intimidate the English clergy into recognizing him as supreme head of the Church uh, and clergy of England as far as the law of Christ allows. Later that year, on July 11, Henry saw Catherine for the last time. Early that morning, he and Anne, along with a few other courtiers, left Windsor where the court was staying, deserting Catherine and never seeing her again. When she sent a message to Henry asking about his health, Henry told the messenger to tell the queen that I do not want any of her goodbyes. He also commanded that Catherine stay at the Moor, a remote royal residence, while Mary stayed at Windsor. It was the last time that Catherine would ever see her daughter. In 1532, Henry asked that Catherine turn over her royal jewels to Anne Boleyn, who had who had been created the Marquess of Pembroke in, in September. Catherine refused, saying, I would consider it a sin and a load upon my conscience if I were persuaded to give up my jewels for such a wicked purpose as that of ornamenting a person who was the scandal of Christendom, which is the closest Catherine ever got to directly insulting Anne. Eventually, however, Henry demanded that Catherine turn over the jewels, and since this was a direct order this time, she did have to obey him, and she obliged. But by this point... A few months later, in November, Cat Anne, after meeting with the French king, had finally slept with Henry, utterly confident that she would soon be queen. She, s she then became pregnant, however, which caused Henry to rush the annulment process and secretly and bigamously marry Anne on January 25, 1533. In April that year, Catherine was told by a delegation of nobles that she was to be known only as the Princess Dowager of Wales. While Catherine was sent off to another remote house, her emblems were torn down to be replaced with Anne's. On May 23, 1533, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, of Can Thomas Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury, ruled that Henry's marriage to Catherine was null and void. He validated Anne's marriage five days later, and on June 1, 1533, Anne was crowned Queen of England. Despite her mistreatment and the public's anger at Anne Boleyn, Catherine made it clear she did not want the Holy Roman Empire under her nephew Charles to invade England, as her as the imperial ambassador urged her to do. And really, this was a smart move, since although the people of England did love Catherine, they were even more xenophobic and probably would have not taken kindly to the emperor invading on behalf of of this cast off of uh, this cast off queen. And then this sounds like such like a radical solution to be suggested for what was a divorce yeah Catherine said i have right. done england little good i don't want to do her any more harm she was like, very much a like i don't understand how the, that would be like a help it it wouldn't so yeah i, I don't understand who like promoted this idea as if it would work Chapuis kept claiming that everyone would support it but he seems to have deluded himself into thinking that ultimately the emperor had a lot on, more on his plate than england so he decided not to go to war with england on september 7 1533 Anne gave birth to a healthy daughter named elizabeth since everyone had expected a prince the celebrations were somewhat muted but henry and Anne, in a ominous foreshadowing uh, 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 ominous echo of catherine and henry were still happy at the birth of a healthy child Elizabeth was now the heir to the throne, and Mary was declared a bastard. Catherine wrote letters to Mary, urging her to resist this demotion, and and, and later on, when they passed the Act of Supremacy, establishing Henry as the head of the Church of England, Catherine urged Mary to resist taking the oath that accompanied it, on, on, even if she would be martyred, which, you know... Sounds a little unfair to her. She is, like... She's a teenager, and Catherine is urging her to be like, oh, don't sign it even if you have to die for it, because your soul is more important than your body. Which I get, I get the perspective, but it is not something we nowadays can uh, yeah. look kindly on, I feel. And also, this is like a, this feels like an issue between Henry and Catherine. Don't, don't bring your kid into it. Well, no, but she's like, if you sign the oath, you are becoming a heretic because you're declaring that Henry's head of the Church of England. Look, I I think she she get to decide whether but she also gets to like, live or die. But also, like oaths taken under duress were commonly accepted at the time as not being valid. So couldn't Mary have just said this, like sworn to the Pope later, said to the Pope later, "Oh, it was under duress. It doesn't count." 
like there's no there's no reason she has to do that. I think that was a bit unfair of Catherine. Uh, Henry, Henry, Mary gladly obeyed her mother in this, and furious, Henry made the Lady Mary, as she was now known, a servant to the baby Elizabeth, and took all, all away most of her maids. Catherine referred to herself still as queen, and refused to be addressed as Princess Dowager, even crossing out on one paper all mentions of the Princess Dowager and replacing them with the queen. That seems a little petty to me. It like, is. Anne is functionally queen. If, if she looks like a queen, talks like a queen has sex with the king like a queen, then come on, you're not you're not the queen anymore. Catherine and Mary refused to swear, as I've said, the, o the oath accompanying the act of supremacy to declare Henry the head of the Church of England. Anne actually visited Hatfield in the early months of 1534 and asked Mary to recognize the validity of her marriage to Henry, and if Mary recognized her as queen, she said, she would be reinstated at court with full honors. Mary refused, saying that she... Quote, unquote, knew no queen in England except her mother, but if Madame Anne Boleyn would do her that favor with her father, she would be much obliged. Infuriated, Anne ordered Mary's governess, her Anne's aunt, to box her ears as the cursed bastard she was and vowed to, quote, unquote, bring down the pride of this unbridled Spanish blood. Which is a little much for a teen. In all fairness, she was feeling threatened, and she was probably really pissed off that this girl wouldn't strengthen her position. Yeah. But, like, also, why would she? So... Henry continued to keep Catherine and Mary apart, forbidding them from communicating. In May 1534, the Pope finally pronounced Henry and Catherine's marriage valid, but it was a bit late for that. Uh, Henry continued... I feel like you're a little late to the party when they've been functionally queen for, like, what now, a four year, years? A, a year. Right. Henry, Henry, although Anne has been functionally queen since, like, 1532, I guess, but when she... Well, 1531, since she was the only woman, main woman at court and Catherine was uh, sent away... The executions of the o mm -hmm. enemies of the Oath of Supremacy began in May 1535, and it read out as a who's who of religious conservatives. Bishop John Fisher, Thomas More, the Carthusian monks. Catherine faced her potential mar- yeah. Catherine thought she was going to be martyred, which I'm not sure she would have been, considering she was the aunt of Charles V, but she wrote, I'm comforted to think that I would follow in the same kind of death those who, sadly for me, I could not imitate in life, as their lives were religious and mad and worldly. In December 1535, Catherine became very ill, and despite a brief recovery, she soon had a serious relapse. Cap Shefley pleaded with Henry to let him see Catherine, and Henry agreed, adding with glee that she clearly wasn't long for this world. That's really mean for your ex-wife. <laughs> Mary, however, was still forbidden from seeing her mother, even though she was dying. On New Year's Day, Catherine's former lady-in-waiting, Maria de Salinas, managed to bluff her way inside Catherine's residence at Kimbledon to be with her. Incredibly, she had ridden 60 miles through the freezing cold at night to be with her mistress for the last time. On January 6, 1536, Catherine made her will, and asked for her debts to be paid and for her servants to be rewarded for their service. To Mary, she bequeathed the gold collar she brought from Spain all those years ago. In the early morning of January 7, 1536, Catherine declined in, in health, and her confessor, worried she wouldn't last until daybreak, offered to waive the rules and give her communion then. Catherine, however, refused, citing numerous examples of how you could not take communion until dawn. At dawn, she took communion and confessed her sins. In the panic of the moment, however, it appears her confessor forgot to ask whether she had co consummated her marriage to Arthur to definitively settle the question. Seems like, a, I, I think I would have written down notes first. Before this, it's pretty <laughs> oh, important. Oh shit, oh shit, we'll never know now! Catherine then dictated Oops. a letter to her husband, which goes as follows. My most dear lord, king, and husband, the hour of my death now drawing on, the tender love I owe you forces me, my case being such, to commend myself to you and to put you in remembrance with a few words of the health and safeguard of your soul, which you ought to prefer before all worldly matters and before the care and pampering of your body, for the which you have cast me into many calamities and yourself into many troubles. For my part, I pardon you everything, and I wish to devoutly pray God that he will pardon you also. For the rest, I commend unto you our daughter Mary, beseeching you to be a good father to her, as I have heretofore desired. I entreat you also on behalf of my maids to give them marriage portions, which is not much they being but three. For all my other servants, they solicit the wages due them, and a year more or less they be unprovided for. Lastly, I make this vow, that my eyes desire you above all things. Catherine the Queen. Catherine of Aragon died at 2 p.m. on January 7, 1536. Although the imperial sh ambassador Chapuis immediately suspected Anne had poisoned her, the truth was more mundane. She seems to have died of cancer of the heart. 
as shown by the black growth that the coroner found. News of the Catherine's death quickly reached the court where Henry gleefully shouted, God be praised that we are free from all suspicion of war. Wow, that's rude. And by this point was pregnant for a third time, the second time having been a mis- ended in a miscarriage in 1534. Henry and Anne dressed in bright yellow, and the court over which Catherine had once presided celebrated her death with dancing and jousts. Catherine was buried at Peterborough Abbey in January 29, 1536, with all the honors of the Dowager Princess of Wales. Mary was not allowed to attend. That same day, Anne miscarried a son of about three and a half months gestation. Henry was furious and swore that he would have no more children with her, and so it was that Anne, who had thought herself secure with Catherine's death, found herself accused, arrested, and put on trial on May 1536 on false charges of adultery, incest, and treason. She was beheaded on May 19, 1536, inside of the walls of the Tower of London, having only survived her arrival by four months. Wow, so the same year they celebrated Catherine's death, she got... Yes, four months later. That's... After examining Catherine of Aragon in her life, in conclusion, it's clear that she was incredibly strong and loving. No matter what life threw at her, whether it was widowhood, penury, Henry's affairs or stillbirths and dead children, or Henry's attempt to annul their marriage and later split with the church, Catherine never gave up. Catherine also continued to love him, as is painfully evident in her last letter to him. Indeed, it seems likely she resisted her attempt, his attempts to annul their marriage and later break with her as, out of her immense love for him. As a loyal daughter of the church, she couldn't dare to see him in danger from her view, his immortal soul, by trying to annul their marriage and reject the authority of the Pope. The amount of courage and strength of character she had was immeasurable. From the age of three, she had been referred to as the Princess of Wales and taught it was her God-given destiny to be Queen of England. Little wonder, then, that she defended her position as Queen so tenaciously. But nowadays, it can be... Two, there are two medical metaphorical elephants in the room before we go, however, when it comes to assessing Catherine. Her refusal to consent to an annulment and a more unpleasant side. Nowadays, it can be too easy to criticize Catherine for not agreeing to an annulment. After all, had she consented, everything would have gone easier in this smoother in this view, and England wouldn't have broken Nowadays, with of Rome. Course, it can be too easy to criticize Catherine for not agreeing to an annulment. After all, had she consented, everything would have gone smoother in this view, and England wouldn't have needed to break with Rome. But Catherine had no way of knowing that her refusal to give up her title would cause Henry to become egotistical and tyrannical. She saw her title as God-given, and for Henry to try and annul their marriage based on the grounds that she had consummated her marriage to Arthur went against that core principle. For Catherine, it was dishonest and immoral to give up her crown and her marriage on dubious grounds. Catherine probably had not consummated her marriage with Arthur, and even if she had, the Pope had issued a dispensation for that as well, saying perhaps he, she consummated the marriage with Arthur. What Henry was arguing was that the Pope had no right to issue dispensations which contradicted God's law in Leviticus, which severely undercut the authority of the Pope and the Church and prioritized Henry's theological views over the Catholic Churches. Catherine, along with many other Catholics, could not acquiesce to this, but she also wanted to protect Mary. If she was acquiesced, then there was every reason, every possibility that Henry could just declare Mary illegitimate anyway, robbing her of her place in the succession, as, especially as contrary to the assertions of some people who claimed that since Catherine and Henry both thought the marriage was good in the first place, Mary would still be legitimate under the principle of the marriage being made in good faith. That was not a thing which existed in England at the oh, time. So you can't really trust Henry not to just bend rules if he feels like it. The in good faith principle was a continental thing. There is an article which I, which I have forgotten, but I will list in the at the beginning of the Anne Boleyn episode next week, and you can look it up then. Which I, which was a very good read, and pointed out that that is not a thing that existed in England. It was Catherine's deep love and faith which motivated her to resist the annulment and the break with Rome, and we ought to understand it in this context. Catherine, however, as I have said, was not a saint. She could be bloodthirsty, as seen when she tried to send King Henry, Henry James of Scot, King James of Scotland's bloody corpse after the Battle of Flodden. But crucially, Catherine owned slaves. She brought a number of converted Moorish slaves from her from with her from to England from Spain. And no matter how she treated them, the fact remains that she is the only one of Henry's wives to have owned slaves. Catherine benefited materially from Spanish imperialism, colonialism, and racism, and it is important to remember to examine her life through this lens, now more than ever. Catherine's slave ownership will remain a blot on her reputation as a person and queen over for, the, for, for as long as she's remembered. And the fact that England didn't recognize slavery so she may have freed them after a few years does not change this fact. So how should we look at Catherine of Aragon? We ought to see past her obstetric history and her piety and her resistance to the annulment, and remember her youthful vibrance, her close bond with her daughter Mary, and her compassion for her subjects. Catherine was, of Aragon was an iron-willed woman who clung to her principles and her faith, no matter what, for better and for worse. And it's high time people recognize her as a strong and, lo- strong and deeply loving woman that she was. 
So, Ethan, what is your final takeaway on Catherine of Aragon before we go? Um, I think she's just someone you have to look at in the context of history, which makes it all the more mind-boggling to me now that there are people who all have very strong opinions on her. A woman from 500 years ago who existed in a context we could not possibly imagine ourselves living through. Yeah, so... I, I think there's a problem, and obviously I, some pe- good people on Tumblr have already, uh, some people on Tumblr, there's been a lot of great discussion about, and not great, somewhat unpleasant at times, discussion about this. It's devolved sometimes into very petty feuds, feuds and stuff, but uh, the, yeah, Tumblr, there's some people I follow on Tumblr have pointed out that standing people in history is not a good look, and I agree. We shouldn't stand people uncritically. We need to look at them and examine all the sides of them, and if we hadn't, as we've seen with Catherine, then, you know, you would have overlooked her slave ownership. So, yeah, this is a, getting to be a really long episode, and I apologize for that, y'all. Next episode on Anne Boleyn will not be this long. So join us next time as we look at Catherine's successor as Queen, Anne Boleyn, the, vilifi- the often vilified and often sanctified figure. Who was she? And why is she so much more than our ultimately tragic beheading? Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next week.